one has been immune from the effects of the pandemic, the disproportionate impact on working women is notable. Over the last year, more than 2.4 million women have exited the labor force, lowering women's labor participation to a rate not seen since back in 1988. So what can be done to address this disparity in the labor market? Let's hear now from Congresswoman Katie Porter of California. She will be interviewed by my friend and CNBC Squawk Box anchor, Becky Quick. Hi, Becky. Hey, Ty, good to see you and uh, good to see all of you today. Thank you for being with us. Um, Katie Porter has been fighting the good fight for women over this last year as they have been unduly impacted by the pandemic. She's been not only fighting the fight, talking the talk, she has been walking the walk. She's not only a congresswoman, she's also a single mom with three kids. So she knows what she speaks of on these matters. And Representative Porter, thank you very much for being with us. It's good to see you. Becky, I actually can't hear you. So I'm going to answer the question that I hope you asked. And I hope that's okay while we get the technical <laughs> difficulties worked out. Um, there you go. I think I can hear you now. Okay. Becky, can you say uh, something? Let me, let me jump in with that real quickly, Katie, just, just so you know what we set this up with. I, I was just saying that you've been really fighting on the forefront for this, and, and you know of what you speak, because you're not only a congresswoman, you are also a working mom with three kids. So you know what you're talking about on these issues. I know it's something you've been following very closely. Um, thanks for being with us today. It's good to see you. Absolutely. And, you know, I think one of the things about the pandemic is people are saying, well, you know, it's really hard for moms. And one of my responses is always, you know, it's not just really hard for working parents since the pandemic started. It has always been really hard for working parents. Child care costs have skyrocketed in the last couple decades. Um, that increasing productivity or longer hours that we hear about um, is difficult for, for parents and those who are caring for seniors as well. And so I think to the extent people say to me, I want things to go back to normal, I think for a lot of working mm -hmm. parents, normal just isn't good enough. We need to actually go back to something better than what we had before. So what, what have you been doing in terms of your role in Congress to try and help parents who are working, for, working from home, maybe working out in the workplace, trying to take care of their kids at the same time? What, what have you done on that front? Yeah, so two things. First is to shine a light on this issue. And we were very early to kind of highlight the fact that schools being closed for public health was having an adverse um, effect on parents, was going to potentially drive up their child care if they were still going to in-person work, or make that juggling of work and family really hard. So my office released a report showing the effect of the pandemic on women in the workforce, and we did it months and months ago. Now, it wasn't picked up broadly into the policy stream until just recently, um, but what we found was that 22% you know, of women have exited the workforce already um, and more are thinking about it. And that this is not, you sometimes hear people say, well, this is industry specific. Women work in the industries that get, that were hardest hit, things like retail or hospitality. But across industries, even considering the industry effects, women are being pushed out. We're highlighting that. We're talking about it at every opportunity. And the second thing we're doing is what can we do about it? Um, and so there, the solution goes from legislative fixes. For example, I have a bill called the Family Savings for Kids and Seniors Act, which would more than double the amount that families could put into pre-tax savings to pay for the cost of childcare. The amount has not been changed since Ronald Reagan enacted the law in 1986, even as the cost of childcare has gone up 200, 300, 400% in that period. So it's a combination of legislative fixes and then also making sure that we're asking ourselves at any point when we're thinking about stimulus, we're thinking about infrastructure, we're thinking about recovery, are we gonna address the fact that unless we make important changes, women will be hurt by this pandemic for two or three years longer than men. It will take two or three years longer, best case scenario for women to recover. Katie, let's, let's dig through maybe one level layer at a time on this. But first of all, you said in terms of women leaving the workforce or, or being pushed out, 22 percent had left their jobs already. Is that because they got forced out by work? Is it because the schools weren't open and they had to stay home to take care of their family? Is it because they chose 
uh, to just do this because they can't make everything meet, all ends meet at this point. What, what did you find in terms of the reason? Because maybe that's one of the ways to try and address getting those women back into the workforce. Well, it's definitely a structural effect. And I think it's really important that we talk about it that way. Um, you know, people do make choices, but their choices are shaped by the opportunities and the challenges that they face. And so if we had men and women are both parents in this country, and if it was really about staying home to take care of kids and we were doing that in a gender balanced way, we would see parents of young children exiting the workforce. What we see is women, particularly women of young children, exiting the workforce. So that tells us that there is a gender-related effect going on. And the result of this, by the way, um, is that female workforce participation is at the yeah. is at 57%. And 57%, it's the lowest level since when? Want to take a guess? 19... 1988. Net close, 19, um, yes, you're right, 1988. Did we tip you off, Becky? Since 1988. So <laughs> I may have read that somewhere. We've gone backwards almost a generation and a half, almost two generations in terms of female workforce participation. Now, we all want women and men, people, workers, to be making the right choices for them about work and family and moving in and out of the workforce as it makes sense. But what we're seeing here is women being left behind. And the result of that 57% female workforce participation, it's not about what happens to women. It's in only in part about that. It's about what happens to our entire economy. So if you care about having a globally competitive economy, then we need to figure out how to allow a lot of those women to re-enter the workforce and re-enter and hit the ground running and recover in terms of pay, promotion, opportunity, talent, all of those things. First of all, let me just say, I'm excited that your whiteboard made an appearance. I would have been disappointed if we didn't see it at some point during this discussion. Um, as a former teacher, too, you know how to make a point and how to use a prop on these things. Um, what, what, what are you hearing from Congress? Because there's two ways to come at this. One is what employers can do, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But what can Congress do? What should they do? Um, and what have they already done to try and reach some of these goals that you just mentioned? Yep. So Congress did provide additional support to stabilize child care providers right from the beginning of the pandemic. And this is important. We already had a shortage of child care in this country, particularly of affordable child care and infant child care. So we provided funding to stabilize child care providers and we re-upped that as needed because we don't want to see child care providers closing. That will drive prices and availability, um, in prices even higher and availability down. And that's opposite of what we need to allow women and working parents to come back into the workforce. So we've been doing that. In this most recent bill, the American Rescue Plan, um, Congress provided for an expanded child tax credit. And that expanded child tax credit is estimated to cut child poverty in half. Um, but it's going to help the bulk of families. We think about, you know, 80, 70 percent of families with kids will get this. What this is going to mean is more money to pay for camp, to pay for child care, to pay for food, to make it possible for parents to go back to work while taking care of their kids. Even if you haven't lost a dollar of salary during this pandemic, I guarantee you that the school closures have strained your working situation and or have required you to spend a lot more on child care than you were before. So that's one big thing that Congress has done, that expanded child tax credit and that support for child care um, providers. In terms of that, though, look, a huge part of this problem was that the schools were shut, are shut in many states, have been shut for a year at this point. Uh, if they are open, a lot of them are only open for part days. And many of those child care centers were shut down for, for months and months. That, that may not have been congressional action that did that. It was state by state with different uh, governors making those, uh, making those decisions. But that was pretty devastating. I don't know if that there was any way around it, but it was devastating. And that probably is the biggest si single reason that you had so many women who left the workforce. Absolutely a huge problem. And, you know, it was funny for me to watch, and it's sort of tragically funny, to watch people start to say in late July or early August, gee, you know, schools aren't opening. We ought to think, do something about that. 
The day I started worrying about getting schools reopened was the day my kids' school closed in mid-March. It was an immediate crisis for me to figure out how I was going to continue to do my job. Um, I was going to need additional child care. I was going to need my kids to be more flexible. I was going to need to be creative. And so the fact that we waited months and months and months until we began talking about schools, which really has only accelerated now almost a year into the pandemic, we see schools becoming a big issue. Congress did act in the American Rescue Plan to provide $120 billion to help to do two things. One, to help schools reopen. This can be used for everything from personal protective equipment to HVAC, um, to air conditioning systems, to expanding um, facilities to spread kids out a little more. And also, the second big thing that money must be used for is to help kids catch up, particularly for certain ages of kids um, and kids with certain kinds of um, disabilities, learning differences, they're going to need help catching up. And we need our Department of Education to be leading the way in creating a plan or how to do that, how to remediate, for instance, kids who have fallen behind grade level benchmarks in learning to read, for example. Congressman and Porter, we've got a, a, a question from the audience. Sarah asks, women exiting the workforce to care for children instead of men, is that because men make more money than women? So we don't know for sure. It's probably a couple different factors. I mean, it's definitely true that on average, women make less money than men. And we recently celebrated Equal Pay Day, um, which is the point in the year at which um, a woman begins to catch up to um, a man in salary. And so that means a couple months, three months out of the year, basically women are coming up short. Um, they're working, but they're not being paid the same as men. So that's one factor. But the other factor we have to acknowledge is, is cultural and social. And so we know, for instance, that when women have time off on their resume, they have a gap, there are assumptions made. Um, women get asked about their childcare arrangements. They get asked about if they have children, questions that are illegal in employment practices. It's definitely a factor. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's not just one solution to this. Um, part of it is a cultural change and a social change, but we have to make the structural changes and then allow people families, couples, parents, to make their own decisions about how best to divide. But there's no doubt in my mind that it's, it's a little bit of both. And we've seen this in research before, by the way. When things are going great, it is men who get to make the decisions. So when a family gets a windfall of extra money, the men decide how to spend that. When times are tough, when people do not have enough to make ends meet, which is what we're seeing right now, it's women who are told you have to find a way to make it work. If you have to stay home, you have to do that. If we have to cut back, you have to figure out how. And so I think that's part of the reaction to this pandemic. It's not unlike what we see with other kinds of crises, which is women being asked to shoulder that both psychological, emotional, uh, mental burden of figuring out what to do in the middle of a crisis. And in too many instances, that's meant having to leave the workforce. And now our job is to get them back. Let's uh, talk about what you think employers can and should be doing as well. This audience is full of senior executives who are grappling with these very decisions right now. What would your advice be? One of the most important things to do is to be in touch with your female employees if they have left the workforce. If you're going to be rehiring, bring those people back. Don't make the assumption that because they left the workforce in the middle of a pandemic that they weren't terrific employees or that they don't want to come back. Let's try to minimize the labor market disruption that we face here. So I encourage people to reach out to employees if they're going to be rehiring and ask them, would you like to come back? What would you, what, you know, when are you ready to come back? We want you back. That's really important because any amount of reshuffling um, is going to disadvantage women and particularly women of color. They're going to have the hardest time competing to get those jobs. They were already behind in terms of what they were paid and the opportunities open to them. So that's one thing I think we could be doing. The second thing is, you know, I think some of the, the ideas discussed in the program before this about how do you help people design workplaces that work for them? And while it's very, very hard to work from home, it is also really difficult to be stuck in traffic for an hour and a half and know that each minute that ticks by, your kid is at, at risk of being thrown out of daycare because you're late. It's really difficult to be asked to travel for meetings that you could have easily done via teleconference. So I think redesigning workplaces to focus on the productivity and stability of your workforce. It makes economic sense, but it's also going to help address some of these inequalities that we've been talking about. 
In Congress right now, as these discussions come up, I, I, I know you've introduced legislation, you've had other co congressional leaders who have signed on and helped you with some of these things. Do you feel like, though, that this is a moment that we are kind of getting past it? Things are getting to where the schools are opening, people are going to move on to the next problem and see what happens there? Or do you think there's real staying power with this? There's real focus and attention on this issue um, that, as you mentioned before, will probably take years to correct. There's going to be real focus on this if we make it happen. And that includes women and men speaking up about this issue, senior leadership raising these issues and being creative, um, pushing for change. If we, you know, like I said, going back to the usual for working parents wasn't very good. It meant unaffordable daycare. It meant long hours. It meant strained relationships. And so we can do better here when we build back. And I think we've seen President Biden adopt that language of build back better, not just with regard to physical infrastructure, roads or bridges, but also with regard to our care economy. But We've seen Biden announce, President Biden, he's going to roll out the builds, the roads and bridges, the traditional infrastructure tomorrow. He said that the infrastructure relating to the care economy is going to be postponed until later, April or May. We need to make sure that when we get to the care economy, it's not golly gee. There's no money left to help make it possible for women to recover economically. There's no money here to deal with this, this she session um, with women being pushed out because we spent it all on roads and bridges, which by the way, despite advances in women in the building trades, those construction jobs are disproportionately male. So I think we're at a real inflection point where we need to be pushing our president to deliver on the promise he made, which is that the care economy and an investment in the care economy is an investment in our nation's infrastructure because it's an investment in our nation's workforce. Child care is just as essential to people being able to do their job as a road or a bridge to get them there. I, I think you just laid out the most likely scenario, though. The idea that these are being split into two bills, there's already enormous pressure from many corners that we've already spent too much. We've spent trillions of dollars, more than $3 trillion. How are we going to do this for infrastructure? If you get that bill passed, what are the odds that there is going to be support for yet another measure that people will say this is not immediate, it doesn't have to happen that way, we were dealing with these problems before and we can get to it eventually. How do you, how do you change that momentum that I think you're gonna be hitting a, a bit of a wall at that point? I think you laid out exactly the American, the Absolutely, the American people need to lift up their voices. And we need to understand, because sometimes they get questions saying, well, you know, I don't have children, my children are grown and gone, you know, why should I, why should I care about this issue? Because let me be clear, every other country is doing a better job than we are. Virtually every other country has paid leave, um, paid sick leave, paid parental leave. Virtually every other country is achieving benchmarks of equality in different professional spheres that we are not achieving. You know, I was elected in 2018, Becky, and it was the, the, you know, the second coming of the year of the woman. And I kept hearing there are so many women and I kept looking around thinking, this does not look like a, women, a room of so many women. <laughs> Congress is still 25% women. When did halfway to parity become so many? Or almost, I think, the allegation, the insinuation, too many. So people across the age spectrum, whether you're a grandparent and you see what this is doing to your kids and grandkids, whether you're a single person just starting out in your career and want to have the kind of workplace that is sustainable and will allow you to have the life that you want to have, raise your voice and push President Biden. Make clear that the people who do the important work of giving care, whether it's for seniors in nursing homes, whether it's child care providers, these are infrastructure workers, every bit as much as a construction worker. And we need to make that investment in the care economy. If we don't, it is to our detriment. And as to the argument, which will inevitably come back, well, it's just we've let our physical infrastructure decay. We've spent so long and haven't invested in roads and bridges. That's true. But to be clear, we have never, ever in the history of this country invested in equal opportunity for working parents and men and women in this work, in our workplace. So that is an even more overdue investment. And we all need to be calling on President Biden to prioritize it. Representative Porter, we're almost out of time, but if you don't mind, I'd love to play true or false with you through a few questions. Absolutely. 
All right, let, let's start with this one. In the beginning of the pandemic, you gave daily COVID briefings to your three children. True or false? True. Um, I would put up the, you know, the number of people who were sick. I would put up um, reminders about wearing your mask. I thought my kids were really good about wearing their mask and really awful about washing their mask. Um, and so we had to create some <laughs> systems around that. I mean, they'd say, I have a mask. And they would hold it up and it would just be filthy. Um, so still use the whiteboard today. It's on spring break. Camps are mostly closed in my area. So even today, I was laying out, you know, 8 to 8.30, half parfaits, 8.30 to 9, pick up, 9 to 10, park time. Um, and really having to use that whiteboard as a tool because I think a lot of kids... You know, school teachers do that. Math time is 10 to 11. They're used to that structure. And so particularly in the early days, I think it helped give our family structure and it helped give me a sense of what I was supposed to be doing. And I would block off two to four. Mommy working, entertain yourself. And I think that's really important too for people to do. Really quickly, uh, true or false, you recently changed your minivan's license plate to badass. Uh, false. Um, it does not say that word because my staff would like me to be a little less spicy um, with regard to using that word. So it, I did get a vanity license plate, though, um, a personalized plate, and it says oversight, O-V-R-S-I-T-E. And it's a. I have to say, I really have not realized all the benefits. Not only am I constantly reminded every time I get in my car the importance of oversight to every aspect of what Congress does, um, but also when someone asks you what's your plate, it's super easy to remember. There you go. Representative Porter, it is a pleasure speaking with you today. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tyler? Becky, thanks so much, and I look forward to seeing you uh, when we get together back on campus here, and I hope it's not too far off. Well, thanks to both of you again.